Hello everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel where I haven't posted anything for one year and a half it would seem. So I would maybe take this opportunity to look back at some of the stuff that I've been making. I have one video in particular here about Ludwig Wittgenstein and his uh, Tractatus. It's a video that I made four years ago and at the time I haven't actually read the book. I've just read some articles and some video essays and I had the audacity to actually make this uh, lecture where I tried to explain the major philosophical ideas of the Tractatus. So I think that now that I've made my, or I'm still writing my master's thesis in the uh, Tractatus, uh, about the Tractatus, I think that maybe now I could point out some of the common misconceptions and misunderstandings that come about when we try to understand the Tractatus, which I'm certain that, well, uh, I, I, uh, well, I'm certain there's some uh, misconceptions uh, in the video that I've made. So maybe this could be a fun uh, little introduction uh, to Wittgenstein and his Tractatus. I think, for you, I mean, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so without further ado... Um... Einstein! Okay, like that. Goldstein! Like, I had a... Wittgenstein! Uh, what? Today we're going to talk about philosophy? What? What? We are going to discuss the ideas of young Wittgenstein as presented in his Tractatus. Wittgenstein, just like Russell before him, basically wanted to know how our thoughts relate to the world. So what is the relationship between us and reality? Now language describes or tries to describe that reality. But how does that work? Yeah, I still stand by that. That's pretty much it. I would say the central, uh, at least at that time, the central focus of both Russell and Wittgenstein was to figure out the relationship between us and the world and language as the medium of our thoughts. Russell had a lot of problems talking about like things that are clearly not existent, such as concepts and like numbers and stuff like what do we make with those and Wittgenstein had some very unique solutions to that problem we don't have to talk about uh, non-existent things anymore because if language is something that actually tries to describe reality obviously in language there should not be any non-existent things and he had a very neat and uh, consistent uh, well, theory uh, make enough for the fact why we are talking about non-existent things all the time, even though language is supposed to merely describe the world. Let's look at how Wittgenstein arrived at a theory that gave an answer to this question. So, once upon a time, the story goes, young Wittgenstein, maybe while serving on the Eastern Front for Mother Austria-Hungary, read a magazine with a report of a lawsuit in Paris concerning a car accident. Before the court, they presented a model of the accident with little cars and houses to represent the street. It occurred to Wittgenstein that the model could represent the accident because of the correspondence between the parts of the model, the miniature houses, cars and people, and the real things, the actual houses, cars and people. Then it further occurred to him that while people discussed the lawsuit with just words, they were actually doing the same thing. They were using words and statements which served as models or pictures of reality. The way in which the parts of the statement are combined, the structure of the statement, depicts a possible combination of elements in reality, a possible state of affairs. The idea was that there is, and in fact must be, a logical structure in common between a statement, like car drives on the road, and a state of affairs in the world, like a actual car driving on an actual road. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's a neat, very colorful entry point into the ideas of the Tractatus. It's also like very easy to understand, it's very straightforward. So the important thing with this uh, uh, anecdote now is to actually explain why this is not just the most basic, straightforward idea, but actually contributed to the uh, uh, 20th century uh, philosophical thought. So the point is, language uses logical connectives to establish relations between names that reflect relations between real objects in the world. The point of the picture theory is not simply to uh, explain how language might be describing the world, but it was the, the main point is to how do I put this, to explain away any possibility of skepticism because you have a lot of like philosophical skeptical attacks through history uh, pertaining to language like okay I have this like uh, sentence structure but how do I know it doesn't merely map ideas in my head how do I know that it actually describes a reality uh, beyond me and he would say, well, these questions make no sense. Uh, when we are using the language uh, that we speak, we are already presupposing a correspondence between our language and reality. Uh, he points to an example of a musician uh, who we would ask, like, yeah, he, here you have a sheet of uh, a musical sheet. And uh, how do you know that, how do you know that the, the notes on the paper corresponds to the melody. This question is completely nonsensical, like the, the notes make sense exactly because there is a correspondence with a melody and the correspondence is in the logical form of the both, like the musical sheets and the melody, the notes and the melody. And what is this logical form? Well, this model theory comes quite handy here because uh, it shows exactly that. Uh, this shared logical structure because you would like say uh, yeah like now they brought this tiny model uh, in front of the jury and you, you might ask yourself like but why can this little thing act as a model for reality and the answer of course is the logical form and what is the logical form it is the conditions of what it can depict and what it cannot depict because like with a tiny model, we can depict that a car is, for example, turned upside down on the on the roof, or it is like uh, I don't know somewhere in the air, or it can be going in reverse. But you cannot show with a model that a one, one car is in two places at once, or two cars at, are at one place at once, and so on. So this is what um, the picture theory is truly about. It is trying to make a point that the logical form of reality is the same as the logical form of our language. There can be, like, uh, you can say a chair is on the table, but you cannot say a chair is in the table, just like you cannot physically put a chair into the table. This logical, this shared logical form is what enables us to speak about the world. And if we accept that, then obviously a logical analysis of language will also tell us something about the limits of the world, what is possible and what is not possible. And then using a logical analysis of language, we can clean all of scientific language and philosophical language of nonsense because now given this shared logical form, we know that, uh, what do we know? <laughs> Given this logical form, we know that there are limits to what we can and cannot express. Yeah, that's... yeah. As Wittgenstein put it, only in this way can a proposition be true or false. It can only agree or disagree with reality by being a picture of the world. Wittgenstein called this idea the theory of logical portrayal, but it later became known as the picture theory of language. The interesting uh, consequence of Wittgenstein's theory is that, uh, according to Wittgenstein, an individual name does not refer. So when I say uh, this chair, I'm not referring to this thing, 
I merely said a word uh, that does not have an explicit meaning. It has an implicit one because when I say that, I am clearly suggesting that there is a unique thing that is to be differentiated from different from other things, namely a chair that is not a table and it is not a house. But I am not naming anything specifically because individual names do not refer according to Wittgenstein. Only sentences do and that's because only sentences paint a picture of reality. And this is all we truly have. We have a, um, a cognitive apparatus that forms different models that then can be applied and uh, well compared with the word. We never know that a sentence is true or false before consulting reality. But when we truly understand a sentence, for example, a chair is next to the table, we know when, exactly when the, the sentence would be true and when it would not be true. Oh, as Wittgenstein put it, the world is the totality of facts, not things. And facts are just the relations between simple objects. But what about those objects? How do we know that we are actually stating a relation between existing objects and that they are not just made up? When exactly is the statement, there is a book, true? So that's a job for science, Wittgenstein said, and it might be struggling at the moment with you know, discovering tinier and tinier realms of reality. It should eventually arrive at some particles that are not analyzable themselves. They can't be split into parts anymore. So once science will do that, according to Wittgenstein, it will arrive at absolute preciseness, since every scientific claim about the world will be analyzable into the exact relation between the simplest elements of reality in the world. So that model of language will not allow for any kind of vagueness or you know philosophical paradoxes or you know any misleading structure everything about our language will just directly reflect the structure of reality yeah so this is kind of true like the point of the book is to dissolve all of the paradoxes and nonsensical questions of philosophy and science and uh, but the point is not uh, an adherence to a physicalist uh, language that would merely map objects in the world such as suggested here the point is more uh, logical if there is a shared logical form between reality and uh, language then using the science of logics we can purge all of the nonsensical expressions of thought, some expressions that do not actually uh, talk about the world because they cannot possibly talk about the world because they break, break the basic logical structure of both the world and language. Of course, that will sound a bit science fictiony, but if I say, like, I have, like, the book is on the table, if I state that statement as a you know complex and long winded simulation of the tiniest parts of reality standing in a certain relation to each other then in fact what I've just said will be absolutely precise and it will there will be no way of misinterpreting it. Yeah, so this is a very scientific, even physicalistic interpretation of Wittgenstein, which is completely uh, it misses the point, I think, uh, Wittgenstein was not trying to tell us how science could describe the world accurately. He was trying to make a more uh, all-encompassing point about the relationship between us, uh, language and the world. Putting out this theory of language, Wittgenstein thought that philosophy is done. Linguistic confusion, vagueness, all of that has been eradicated from this model of language and science can get down to work with the tools that it has been given by philosophers. All of the paradoxes about nature and like the questions about meaning of life, about ethics and all of that, all of that has been dissolved because it's impossible to even formulate it in this language. 
And of course, if you can't formulate it in this language, then it, it has nothing to do with reality. This has some unfortunate and quite puzzling uh, consequences, one of which would be that most of the things we say in philosophy are nonsensical because they are not forming a picture of the world, they are not modeling the world, but they are something else, and that something else is meaningless. But, and here's the tricky part, the tractatus is philosophy, it is not modeling the world, it is talking about language itself, it is like not picturing a world, but it's talking about the picture itself, it's self-referential, and according to its own standards, it is meaningless, which then would Wittgenstein suggest that yeah, it is meaningless, it is coming from a standpoint of a radical confusion, aiming to show its internal contradictions in order to show that we are to abandon all of the language and philosophy that it has been based upon. So the final two thesis, theses, I don't know the plural, but yeah, they would suggest that, yeah, first of all, um, we have to recognize that all of which Wittgenstein has been talking about is meaningless, and, and then we have to throw all of those sentences away, just like we would throw away a ladder that we have already used in order to get places. And then the only true thing, the only true uh, insight that stays from the Tractatus is that, yeah, whatever we cannot talk about, thereof we must be silent. We can merely talk about the world around us, we can model the world, but we cannot possibly model something that has no basis in reality. So yeah, this is me talking about Wittgenstein a couple of years ago and talking about Wittgenstein now. I'm a bit surprised that I've been able to put so many of his ideas adequately in the previous video. Maybe that was easy for me to do because I was handling with second-hand already formed explanations of his philosophy, while now I'm trying to understand him myself from the primary texts, which is really difficult given his uh, idiosyncratic, often obscure style of writing. Obviously some things that I've said in the previous video were quite misleading, so I hope I've been able to explain why they are as such. Um, I hope I wasn't too confused or all over the place with this video now. Uh, this uh, style of commenting uh, proved to be a bit more chaotic than I imagined it to be, especially when talking about a topic that you are in the midst of researching. So maybe that wasn't the best idea, but uh, now it's already done, so I'm putting it out there. Because I haven't been posting for one year and a half and I was just curious to see whether there's anyone out there still uh, following this uh, channel interested in some content perhaps uh, yeah, so if, if yes hello <laughs> long time to see thanks for staying and thanks for watching this video uh, hopefully i will put out more in the future i hope hopefully Are you searching for motivation for that real philosopher's life? I recommend to you Ray Monk's book on Dutrich Wittgenstein, The Duty of Genius. It simultaneously, simultaneously, simultaneously covers both like Wittgenstein's life and how his philosophy developed. It's a very interesting read and you can read that book. And that's where I introduce my sponsor. There is no sponsor! Fast cars and beaches? No thank you! Baby Flopola is living that poor Diogenes life! Stand out of my son, money!